So, today we're going to study the sense of balance. And um, um, you can see here that there's a year lobe, the canal, and I mentioned last week that the skin around the canal is like a conveyor belt moving your wax out of your ear. And there's your ear drum, those are your ossicles, and uh, there's the, your cochlea, in which you find your auditory system. Well, like right beside it is this balance system. This is it in, in larger form. And you can see it has various parts that we'll talk about it, talk about it today. Now inside, um, one, one of the parts is these purple parts, and this is called the labyrinth, and largely because it is like a labyrinth, it's a series of tunnels in the skull um, that you can, if you're a little creature, you can get lost in. And the, the tunnel is lined with a membrane, and between this membrane and the bone, there's a fluid. It's called paraffin, paralymph, and it's similar to extracellular fluid. So that is fluid that's around cells, not within your cells like neurons. And um, um, inside the membrane, we've got a, a different fluid. That, so that's the orange stuff here. And it's a cell similar to intracellular fluid, uh, which is usually low in sodium and high in potassium. Sodium is usually outside the cell and only enters the cell um, when the cell is activated. So this endolymph that's all through this orange fluid bathes the hair cells, both in the auditory system and the vestibular system. And one of the interesting thing is, is it's got this high charge of plus 80 millivolts. And we'll discover the importance of that charge uh, a little later on in the lecture. Now, why are the auditory and vestibular systems uh, together in, near, near each other? Well, it's because they have a, a common or origin in, in the fish that developed prehistorically. Um, along the side here of the fish, something called the lateral line organ, lateral line organ, and it's a series of tubes, and within these tubes there are hair cells, and these cells get bent by two, one of two things. One is waves that, are, that come from some noise in the water, something, uh, another fish moving in the water, or uh, rumblings in the, in the ocean. Um, and that's a precursor of the auditory system. The other thing that can activate the structure is the fish's motion. So as it swims through, it pu pushes water through these tubes. And that's the precursor of the vestibular system. So this one thing in the fish serves two purposes. Um, in us and in and, and, and every mammal, um, they, they, they've, the, the structure of the two have evolved in different directions and specialized more. One more for, mo for your sense of motion, of what you're doing, and the other is for, for, to hear what's the, in the outside world. Now, the, the sense of motion um, has to uh, two parts. Um, one is the otoliths, which are this orange part here, and the other is the semicircular canal, uh, this purple part here. And um, they serve 
two different functions. The canals uh, sense the detect if, if you're rotating, so a turning motion. Uh, either you, uh, you or, like here you see the whole body turning. Uh, it could be just the head turning from side to side. The otoliths, they have another function. And they're, 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 that function, in fact, has two parts to it. One is when you move, so in a, but you move not in a rotation, but in a straight line, either forward, backwards, up or down, or sideways, or some combination of the, the two. Um, the other thing is that it senses gravity, so which, which way is down. And so when you're like this, you can sense that gravity is, is in this direction, even though you're upside down. Now, the, again, we have sort of a, a division of two. Um, the odalis themselves, they're like two egg-like structures. This is the utricle, and this is the sacule. And each has a patch on the inside of this egg. And on this patch, or macula swelling, you have these hair cells protruding, similar to the hair cells that we saw last week. And these cells, again, like the ones we saw last week, connect to the eighth nerve. And we have thousands of these cells sticking out on, up into the inside of the egg like structure. Again, these hair cells are like the ones we saw before. They're, they're, they've got this crew cut with a kind of ceiling at one end. And in this case, however, on the surface of the inside of these eggs, you've got a jello-like substance. And on the top of that jello-like substance, you've got stones scattered. And these stones are to give this gel extra mass. And the reason extra mass helps is when you move, these stones tend to stay in place, and that bends these hair cells. So again, like before in the auditory system, these hair cells bend and tiny little threads open and close valves and potassium uh, ions uh, enter the cells and depolarize them and that produces transmitter release and your eighth nerve fires. The other thing that's important is this 80 millivolt charge, okay? Now these uh, potassium ions have a positive charge to them. So in a sense, the voltage pushes them into the cell. The, the voltage in the cell, in fact, is lower than the voltage on the outside. So that helps these, the, whenever the flap opens, these cells enter quickly into the tubes of the, the tops of the hairs. Now, you can see here the, the effect of these stones. So every time your head moves forward, the, the hairs want to stay put in place, the stationary in place. And that bends the hairs, so they can bend towards or away the conicillium. And when they bend in this direction, they open. In this direction, they close. And you can see the volt firing rate increasing and decreasing depending how these flaps open or close. And 
But one thing that's important is you never see a zero activation of these, this eighth nerve. It's always active. Is that screen still up? Okay, it just momentarily popped out. Now, you can also open and close the, flap, the tops of the hair cells by bending your head, and then gravity exerts its effect. When you bend your head in one direction, you can see in this case, this hair cells uh, flaps close, and you bend the head, hair cell in the other direction, it opens them. So you can see uh, that how these uh, uh, hair cells in, in your otoliths can have served these two functions. One is you're moving back and forth in a straight line, or you're bending your hair uh, head back and forth. Okay. Now, why are there, there there's why is there a neutrophil in the saccule? Why have two eggs in there? Well, one one the important reason is that this uh, surface that, that, uh, on which the hair cells exist uh, is located differently. In one, it's located at the bottom. In the other one, it's located on the side. Um, and you can see here the, the arrows indicate where your kind of cilium is. So the, there, there's your hair cell. There's uh, the hair cell from above with a kind of big hair there. And that's the direction of the arrow. And you can see here both the neutrophil and the saccule, these arrows pointing in every possible direction. So you actually, I've only had uh, maybe a, a two dozen here, but there's actually thousands of these hairs here pointing in every direction. Now, you can see that, that uh, with the hair upright, uh, the, the, in the utricle, um, it's, it's horizontal. So it's like uh, the surface of this table. So um, all the hair cells are growing. Imagine all the hair cells growing up out of the surface of the table. So it's going to be sense you can be able to bend the hair cells in because they're pointing in every direction but uh, um, on the surface of a table so when you move the table left or right or forward or backwards you'll be able to bend one or at least one or more of these hair cells but if you move the table up or down you're 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 pushing against the the tops of the hairs that's got not going to bend them. In contrast, the hairs on the saccular are at a part that's uh, perpendicular to that. So it's like a sideways, an edge on the table, or the, the, the surface of your screens of your laptops. Okay, so now you can move your, the, the, your laptop screen uh, left or right and up and down, and you'll have some hair that gets activated, but not if you go forward or backwards, at least your, my laptop. But this is turned sideways, so it's gonna be activated by uh, up or down and forward or backwards. So it's like your laptop screen sideways on your desk. The, the other part of the vestibular system is these canals. Um, and there's three on one side and three on the other. You have something here, the horizontal canal, which is again like a, uh, the, this donut that's placed on the table. Okay, so that's the plane of that canal. 
These other two are like things, a donut perpendicular to the table. Moreover, they're perpendicular to each other. So if you had a cube, you could fit it in this corner and this corner. Okay. Um, now, if you just imagine the, the geometry, this canal up here, this anterior canal, is in the same plane as this posterior canal. This anterior canal is the same plane as this posterior canal. So that geometry is important, as we'll see just in a moment. So, within the canals, you have a, a widening, this again called an ampulla, and you've got a cupola. This is like a, something that seals the ends of, of, of the canal, and so water, fluid can't go through it. Inside this canal, you have fluid, and it can push the hairs that are look grow into this cupola. So you can see here the head turning back and forth horizontally. And you can see again uh, the hairs in your hair cell being pushed in one direction, opening the flaps and pushing in the other direction, closing the flaps. And you can see this plus and minus changing here. Again, that would increase or decrease the firing rate. Now, each canal has a preferred direction. So if I click here, this is my left horizontal canal. You can see an increase in firing rate. Okay? At the same time, this canal here on the opposite side in the same plane so both these are horizontal, decreases. Okay. If I do the opposite, if I uh, turn my head to the right, okay, it this increases, and again, the opposite decreases. So turning to the right increases the activity of the right horizontal canal, an easy thing to remember, and turning to the left increases the activity of the left horizontal canal. Now things get a little more complicated. This anterior canal, this anterior canal is on your right, okay? When I tilt in this direction, so you can see I'm tilting uh, sort of with my, uh, in the direction with my nose down and my right ear down. So something like in this movement. It's not the nose straight down. It's not the ear bending directly towards your right ear. It's a combination of those two things. So when I do that, I activate that canal. That's turning in the canal's plane. At the same time, the other canal was that we said on the opposite side, the posterior and the opposite side, it decreases its activity. Okay. And then when I go this way, I increase the activity. So I tilt my head backwards, but again, a little bit towards the other ear. I get an increase in activity of that canal, but at the same time, a decrease in the other canal. So remember that, that all these canals are tonically active. And when the head turns in one direction, you increase the activity of the canal. When the head turns in the opposite direction, you decrease the activity of that canal. But it's always acting on a basal rate, a firing rate. 
So we can see here the canals act in pairs. Um, when one of the canals get activated, um, the other gets inhibited. But if you so, we're, you notice that that in these cases here, we're always activating just two or changing the activity in just two canals at once. The others are silent because the motion, then the motion of of the fluid in, in those canals is perpendicular to the direction we're turning. So if we're turning in the direction along the plane of one of the canals, we won't be activating the changing activity in the other canals. Okay. So why do this? Why ha have these canals? What do they do? Well, one important thing they do is help you keep looking at whatever it is you want to be looking at, in spite of the fact that your head is turned. So all of you can keep your eyes on somebody while you turn your head. And you can do that, try shaking your head really rapidly. You'll find that you have no trouble staring at someone while you shake your head. Okay? And that's rather amazing because your head is shaking really rapidly. And to be able to do that, you're turning your eyes in the opposite direction. So you're just equalizing the head turn by the eye turn. And as a consequence, your eyes stay stable in space. So they stabilize the eye ball in space by turning your head. And you can turn your head in whatever direction you want and it will stay stable because you've got those three canals on each side and they are wired to do that job. So the ideal gain, the, something called the gain, which is the, the, the ratio of how much the head moves divided by how much the eye moves. And the ideal gain is minus one. So the, the, if the head turns this much, the eye's got to do the exact opposite, but in the opposite direction. And if it does this, everything will stay stable on the back of the eye, and you'll be able to see whatever you're looking at clearly. How does it do that? Well, it's got a really sharp reflex for doing that. You can see here your canal. It connects onto the vestibular nucleus. It goes to the motor neurons. They're located, the motor neuron of this muscle is located on this side. So that goes to that muscle. But then there's neurons that go to the muscles of the opposite eye, okay? So you've got these two muscles. This one here is called the medial rectus, and this is the lateral rectus. And both when these two muscles contract, the eye turns to the left. So you can see here that as the eye head turns to the right, as we said before, the activity of the horizontal canal will increase on this side. You can see that there's ton activity at first, and then when the head starts turning, it gives you more activity. And as this goes to these neurons here, that increases the activity of these two muscles here. They contract and they turn the head, the eyeball in the opposite direction. At the same time, you've got this canal here, 
Remember, the opposite canal decreased its activity. So all the neurons on the mirror image circuit, they decreased their activity. And this is connected to that muscle and to that muscle, and both these muscles relax. So when this muscle contracts, that muscle relaxes, and the movement can proceed without any interference. Now, if that happens, okay, so you can see the, the head turning, the eye turning in the opposite direction, and out of the eyeball, what do you see? You see a stationary image. Okay. Well, that's what the, what the whole thing is trying to do. Now, if something is wrong, okay, you get retinal slip. And this activates something called the optokinetic reflex, which we'll look at in a moment. And it's called, one, the abbreviation of this is the OKR. And it will, as yes, assist this reflex. Okay, before we do that, we need some waking up. Okay, so if all of you could please stand up. Okay, before we do that, what, what was that? How is this affected if the eyes closed? Ah, we'll see that in a moment. <laughs> we see that in a moment. Uh, do you think you have a VOR when the eyes are closed? No. Well, all of you can find out. Put your hands on your eyes and turn your head. See if your eyes move. Now, if you move it just a little bit back and forth, you'll feel it turning just a little bit. If you move your head a lot, you'll hear, feel something going bang, 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 bang. You'll find out what that is in a moment. Yes. OK. Um, so OK, what I would like you to do is stand on one foot and see how long you can stand, okay? Who's the first to fall down? What? Oh, there's one. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, that's pretty good. Okay, we won't ask you to do it any longer. Okay, well, that was easy, okay? Now we're gonna do it again. Okay, this time stand up with your eyes closed. Put your hand on one foot and then close your eyes. Whoops, we got one down, another one down, another one down. <laughs> okay, okay, that, I think that proves the point uh, that uh, with your eyes closed, you can't stand as long. Okay, and the, the other thing is stand up on one foot and see if this affects your ability. Starting now, okay. A little bit more unstable if you look at the screen. And that's because your visual system is affecting your stability. So before you're able to stand quite clearly, and the guys that are up front are having the most problem because this this system is affecting those the closest to the screen. But if I uh, don't stand still, I stand on one feet, but I move a little, does it go back up into it? Does it? Okay. So let's you can sit down now before somebody has an accident, <laughs> and I'm sued for doing experiments with per, without permission. I don't have an ethics review for this class. Okay, so what modalities contribute to one's balance when standing upright? Well, we'll say yes for the vestibular system. What about touch? Uh, 
I think I see more nods than I see shakes of the head. And it is, yes. The, the, you can imagine the pressure on the touch receptors on the soles of your feet. They are very good at telling you're pressing harder on the toes or a little bit of toes. They help maintain balance by pushing the body up or down depending on how you're leaning. Proprioception, yes or no? Yes. Yes, again, when you your body leans forward inadvertently, okay, you stretch the muscles in your legs and they react with your the reflex that, that we studied that before. Vision. Yes, again, yes. Because we saw when you closed your eyes, this was a lot more difficult. And the auditory system. Some some shaking of the head, some some yeses. Okay. It depends. If um if the sound you knew was something stationary, you might be able to use it as a cue to keep yourself stable, but uh, that would take practice. And it might help. Okay. Next, we'll we'll see. We'll study why you get dizzy. Okay. You can see here. Uh, you start rotating. And after a bit of time, so when you start rotating, it bends your cupola, but soon after, it comes back to a vertical, in the vertical direction. When it's in the vertical direction, it's telling you that you're stationary, but in fact, you're still moving. So you start the rotation, press against the cupola, and you keep turning, and your cupola comes back to stationary, even though you're still turning. Okay, so this is, what you, if I, you were on um, one of these rotating chairs instead of the chairs that you were on, they get round and round. A few cycles, the cupola is back to a vertical position. And with your eyes closed, and if you couldn't feel anything else, you would think you were stationary. So this is what would happen. If you were stationed, were turning, we'll start again. You were turning you're, with your eyes closed here. You don't see anything. Then suddenly you open your eyes. Your hair cells, while you were turning, had told you you were, you were stationary. So initially, you have this movement of everything in the world. And when you see this movement of everything in the world, you feel dizzy. This is what, what causes this dizziness. Your cupola in your hair cells have, are telling you that you're still, and your visual system tells you something different, that you're moving. And because of this difference, you sense that you're, 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 you're. Now, sometimes when, when you see retinal slip, it kicks in to help the VOR, even without your head turning. So here you can see the, the, the VOR trying to, st the, the, the optokinetic system then, the OK system, um, responding to this retinal slip by turning your eyes in the opposite direction. And it can, with time, stabilize your movement. It can also give you this false perception of movement. If you're, for example, uh, sitting in a car and the car in front of you starts to move, you often feel you're rolling backwards. Okay? Or if you're sitting on a train and the train beside you starts to move. You feel your train is moving. Okay, So it's this optokinetic reflex kicking in, telling you that you're moving. And normally, they work together.
to uh, keep you stable. So you can see it's drawn here. So here's the vestibular system. It quickly comes back to telling you that you're not turning. The visual system initially does it. Is it take, takes time for it to respond, but gradually it builds up. So as this one dies away, this one builds up, and the two of them will compensate for your turning round and round and round in a circle. You'll still have a good sense of balance with your eyes open, at least if you practice it. Now, what's happening here? Okay, you see this ballet dancer trying to avoid becoming dizzy. And why, what's she trying to do? Is she suppressing the signals from her inner ear to her brain? Anyone who thinks that, put your hands up. Not too many hands. Is she providing a fixed focus for her eyes? Uh, about half the class. Okay. Is she preventing the head from turning continuously? The same class. The same. Some some put up their hands for both. Okay. And the answer I think is this. So yes, the, 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 the dancer is spotting and attempting to fix things, but that's not what's preventing her from becoming dizzy. Okay. She's doing that, she's doing the spotting for an entirely different reason. What, what you, you can see is her head is stationary, it's, and then turning very rapidly, and then stationary again, and then turning very rapidly. So she's not keeping a continuous motion of the cupola that would adapt the VOR. Okay? She's preventing continuous rotation of the head. Now, one of the consequences of becoming dizzy is that uh, uh, sometimes you get motion sick. And motion sickness occurs when there's a conflict of these two signals. So here you are inside the cabin of your boat. The boat is going up and down because the seas are rough. And your vestibular system tells you that. But you're inside the room, this room, and you're, let's say you're, in this case, not looking out the window. And as a consequence, everything in front of you is moving up and down with you. So your visual system is telling you that you're not moving. And this is a, a, a dichotomy between those two systems. And that's what causes you to become motion sick. The best thing to do is to prevent motion sickness, is go out on the deck and watch the far horizon, in which case your visual system and your vestibular system will be giving you the same signals and hopefully that will prevent motion sickness. The same thing happens in a car ride. Often, you, many people get motion sickness in, in a car ride. And that's often because they're inside the back seat of the car and worse still, looking at their iPads. Okay, that's the worst thing you could possibly do to get motion sick. The best thing to do if you're in a car and you're susceptible to motion sickness is sit in the front and look out the front window. Now, some people not only get motion sick, but they get nausea. And no one knows for sure why you get nausea, but and um, one theory is that uh, when there's this dichotomy, uh, so one neuron's firing one way and the other neuron's firing another way, that's, and that's abnormal, the brain thinks that there's a poison, uh, uh, 
you've swallowed some poison, so it's affecting your neurons. And as a consequence, you try to get rid of that poison by vomiting. Um, yeah, astronauts, the first day or two, they're up there. They are, have all of them almost have motion sickness, severe motion sickness. Now, you could imagine that uh, this, this system, the VOR, um, doesn't stay at a gain of one forever during one's lifetime. Um, if it wasn't being tuned constantly. You can imagine that, that hair cells could get affected. You can imagine that neurons could get affected. You can imagine that muscle strength gets affected. And the, the strength of this reflex changes over the course of your lifetime. Now to keep it, and also things that change, is per, the type of lenses that you wear, wear prescription glasses. Um, if you look through your prescription glasses, the position of where people really are compared to where you see them through your prescription is at a different place. If you look through the side of your prescription glasses, there's a difference. That means when you rotate your head a certain amount, the amount that the person is would be if you weren't wearing your glasses is different. So depending on prescription, it could be more or it could be less. And your VOR has been adjusted to work just perfectly for your glasses. How does, okay. So you can see life could be fairly bad if your VOR weren't working like Right. If you were, for example, jogging, this is what the world would look like while you were jogging. It'd be very difficult to read what the sign says while you're walking or jogging. Now, what's nice is that the VOR adapts. So all this retinal slip uh, quickly adjusts the reflex so that now the VOR has become normal again. How did it do that? Well, this is the reflex we talked about, but there's an overlying, ref another reflex overlying it called the indirect pathway. So the indirect pathway goes through these mossy fibers, then up to these parallel fibers, then making a synapse to this uh, neuron here called the Purkinje cell, and then back down to your vestibular cell. All this circuit occurs within a structure called the cerebellum, which is underneath your cortex at the back of your head. Now, so this input here from the Purkinje cell has a negative effect on the, the, this neuron here. So it decreases the activity of this neuron. Remember that, 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 uh, that these neurons are tonically active. And so what you're doing is either uh, decreasing or removing this decrease. So getting rid of inhibition or adding inhibition. So as a consequence, modulating how much activity heads towards the eye muscles. Now what what's added to the circuit here is something, this circuit in red, okay, and this circuit in red comes of visual input on the eye. So whenever a year see retinal slip, that circuit gets activated. It activates this climbing fiber. And then this climbing fiber, which is like a vine growing over almost every uh, dendrite of this Purkinje cell, 
um, gets activated. Um, and you can see here that when there's a collision of an action potential here and an action potential here, you've got simultaneous activity occurring and probably the synapse between this parallel fiber and this Purkinje cell will get changed because of the simultaneous activity. So, what are the steps of, of this circuit? Step one is something goes wrong with your VOR. If something goes wrong with your, your VOR, whenever you turn your head, you'll get a slip of the image on your retina. And that happens every time something goes wrong. You get slip on the retina. The other thing that then happens is you get activity along this climbing fiber. This climbing fiber is like the teacher. Uh, so it teaches this network. And if it's working right, then it changes the connections between the, this parallel fiber and the Purkinje cell. And that affects how much this circuit is, 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 is active. And it acts, reduces the activity of the circuit in this case. And that then, hopefully, uh, returns the VOR to its optimal um, thing. And if it does so correctly, then this uh, uh, input from retinal slip will disappear. So when there's no retinal slip, this circuit returns to normal, stops changing it. So it's a very simple circuit. Whenever there's an error, retinal slip gets activated. That's an afferent input. That activates the teacher. The teacher teaches the circuit to change. That makes a change. The circuit keeps changing it until this retinal slip goes away. When it does so, the teacher becomes quiet again. So this is called a repair shop. The, the cerebellum is a repair shop for most of your reflex. Not only the VOR, but almost every reflex that you have. And that is how the cerebellum adds things like skills to, for you to, to ski, catch a ball, anything that you do physically. And that's it for today. Thank you.